the fact is a lot of these films are really under duress through neglect. They were not shown a lot, and oftentimes the negatives were in labs that then disappeared. And so um, we realize now that uh, it's going to take a lot of work to really restore these films um, so that people will have them to see in another hundred years. So without further ado, Maya Montanez Smakar. Thank you, Chris. I have to, um, enormous thanks to Chris for, I, when I was in that seminar a million years ago, I wrote a very mediocre paper on women directors in the silent era. And so thank you, Chris, for believing I could get better. And I did. <laughs> thank you all for coming. This is such a thrill and just a real delight to be able to bring um, my work with this book, Liberating Hollywood, um, to the screen and to audiences. An enormous thank you to KJ Relf, <coughs> who is um, a programmer here at UCLA and who worked on this program with me and worked so hard in finding these prints um, to speak to what Chris was saying about how uh, difficult it was to find some of them and to really make sure that um, we can ensure their safety um, so that future film goers can enjoy them. Um, tonight we are starting off with um, two films by Joan Tewksbury and Joan is here with us tonight. So honored to have her here and on our opening night. Um, so please stay for a Q&A. We're starting with Old Boyfriends. We're going to do a, a Q&A with Joan in between and then we'll follow with Thieves Like Us. Um, I'd also like to thank um, Ed and Annie Pressman for helping us with the print that we uh, were able to get, and they were an enormous help. So thank you both, Annie and Ed. Um, a little bit about liberating Hollywood and Hollywood during the 1970s. Um, there is a well-loved mythology about Hollywood during the 70s that anyone who was young and ambitious and loved movies could make one. And in a lot of ways, that was true. The film industry during the 1970s was going through many um, industrial, um, economic, creative adjustments, trying to figure out how to make movies for a growing and demanding young audience that had much different tastes than their parents' generation. Um, there were many competing production cultures that were intersecting with Hollywood at the time. Uh, independent exploitation films, like the movies that we're going to showcase tomorrow, Barbara Peters um, films. Um, an influx of foreign films that were appealing and challenging and um, invigorating American audiences and filmmakers pornography also. So a lot of things were happening in the 70s and Hollywood was really trying to figure out um, how to stay current, how to uh, make films that were both artistically um, exciting and also um, commercial, uh, successful, had successful commercial um, potential. There also, of course, were the social justice movements that defined the 60s and 70s, the civil rights movement, the women's movement, the youth movement, the uh, anti-war movement, sexual revolution, counterculture, drug culture, rock and roll, et cetera. And so what liberating Hollywood is interested in is this intersection between the shifting cultural, social, political landscape and how that intersected with the changing um, film industry. And so in that moment, there was this opportunity for young filmmakers to enter the film industry in a way that previous generations hadn't before. But the, the important note is that that access was um, predominantly for white men. But what started to stand out to me is that because of the influence of the feminist movement changing all areas of American social and political and cultural life, that there was actually 
a number of women for the first time in generations who were starting to make feature films. And who were those women? And why were they never talked about? And why were they not commonplace in this mythology about Hollywood during the 1970s? And so that's what Liberating Hollywood, the book and the series, looks to celebrate. Um, and um, what I found in my research is that there were 16 women. I hope there, I hope I missed some and somebody tells me there were more, but for my years of research, I found 16 women who were making feature films in the United States in the 1970s. And they really ran the gamut. They were folks who made independent films, um, like Old Boyfriends Tonight, who made uh, grindhouse exploitation films, like Barbara Peters and Stephanie Rothman, folks like Elaine May, who were able to work in the studio system. Uh, and so there was a really diverse selection of filmmakers. And, um, and they are such an important part of American cinema in the 1970s. The, um, the category of woman filmmaker is forced. It's a fake category. Um, we are forced to use it because we have to speak about discrimination and sexism. Um, and so that's something that liberating Hollywood pays attention to in studying the specific moment um, in the 1970s, this very specific historical moment um, when Hollywood and um, American social, the, the, the landscape of America um, in terms of social and political issues intersect. But what's really important is that we look at these filmmakers beyond gender and we look at them as individual artists who were coming of age in the 70s and the incredible contributions that they made <coughs> to, um, to, again, American cinema. And, um, and so in this series, we're really able to celebrate these folks as um, the individual artists that they are. So um, thank you so much for coming. We have an incredible series that runs throughout February. And um, please stay for the Q&A with Joan Tewksbury and, and enjoy Old Boyfriends. It's the one time we really can enjoy an old boyfriend tonight. <laughs>
let's start with that opening scene. What was how uh, how did you construct it? I mean, to introduce us to that character, her character. There was a different beginning, and it was pretty soft. Mm -hmm. And so this was shot after after we completed the film, and it it immediately put you. It made you question what the hell was going on with this woman, which is a, a much better outcome, you know, for the whole of the movie. And um, it it for it doesn't foretell, but it for you know it foretells just enough. It puts so you on the edge of your seat. Yeah. So it, it so the constructing uh, the construction of that scene was really important, and it was um, a decision. Bill Reynolds, the editor. I, I mean, the, the help on this film was ex incredible. And it, it was really, I think, a mutual sort of discussion that we should get harder. You know. B before we get into how, who worked with you on this film and that idea of, of uh, the help and the support that you had with your um, crew, tell us how you came to direct this film. I mean, you first, your first job on a feature film is script supervisor on Com McCabe and Mrs. Miller. Yep. And then, that's a pretty good first job. <laughs> I was a terrible, terrible script person. I mean, I came from theater, so I was really convinced that you needed to write all the motivation and the blah, blah. And um, I, it, uh, no, I made some big mistakes in that film. And I knew that I would never do that job again. And so um, I wanted to direct. I had been a choreographer. And Altman said, you know, uh, you're going to have to write whatever you do. I did. He tried to produce it. It didn't work out. We couldn't raise 10 cents on Geraldine Chaplin or myself. <clears throat> so the opportunity came because Jeff Berg was both Paul Schrader's and my, and my agent. And um, so Paul was backed up with all his uh, good luck on uh, uh, Blue Collar. And then, um, uh, I forget, the, the, there was a series of them. And he and his brother had written this film. So um, if, if really to do old boy, you know, going, uh, going back and seeing old girlfriends. That's what the script initially was. That's what the script f originally was. And it was that time when, once again, if, you know, the, the women, it was the year of the woman, and you're going, oh, hey. And um, so it, it was shifted, and then there was, you know, minimal, re there was a, I did a rewrite on it just to um, pull it into the girl's direction a little bit more. Um, but it was, a, it was a process, really, then, of Ed. Um, you know, saying yes, you know. Ed Pressman. Ed Pressman going producing. through this uh, process to say yes, it, that he would produce it, which um, was a miracle, you know. Why do you describe it as a miracle? Um, it wasn't too easy to get a job directing a movie or, I mean, others did and did it beautifully. And at the time, I think there were three Jones, a Claudia, and an Amy. And... Um, so the at least Joan Micklin Silver had had really sort of pushed through with he Hester Street, and then Joan Darling, and so it I don't, it wasn't easy. It, in fact, it was damned hard, you know. So, so you felt even with the support of Robert Altman and a Paul Schrader script. There were still challenges. Yeah, there were challenges, especially with with Bob, because a lot of people had prejudice against Altman. And so if you came along and you had worked with Bob, everyone went, oh, really? Good. Next. <laughs> you know. And after doing uh, in Nashville, it, it was not just a sort of character. I mean, it was a character piece driven by a lot of people. So um, nobody was interested in doing one of those. Um, it was hard. No, it was it was very difficult. Girls were not in the club yet. It's what you said. The younger men 
uh, sort of pushed through George Lucas, and this is why in the shot out of Buck Henry's window, I pay homage <laughs> to Star Wars because they had managed to kick down the doors of the old men's club in a way. So um, I've been grateful to men ever since because the people that helped me most in this, in, in this line of work were men. There weren't women at the time w as women producers or it was not firmly in place. And so I would say that um, through the course of time, some of the most help that I have gotten have been from men. Tell us how you worked with your, I in, in this vein, how you worked with your editor and your cinematographer. They're both veteran. And, and um, they were very generous. Mm -hmm. And um, I had, yes, you have ideas of, I had ideas for, for, for all of this. I just, uh, but I, the person that probably helped the most was Peter Jameson who is no longer with us. And he was the production designer. And there was another production designer, and it, it wasn't right. And Peter Jameson walked up the stairs. I turned a corner. I took one look at him. He looked at me. I said, that's it. And it was. I worked with Peter for the next, you know, I, after this, I did a lot of television film. And so Peter was like your, your other arm and with a similar mindset, a similar taste about things, and uh, most importantly, a sense of humor and dark. And so it was, he was the one that came up with the John Belushi um, uh, hotel suite. Mm. As written, it was supposed to be in a very chic hotel. We had looked at the Biltmore in downtown Los Angeles, and Peter came in and said, I want you to see this. It was the, um, oh, God, uh, Rudolph Valentino suite at a hotel on Spring and way downtown. And I walked in and I said, oh, yeah, <laughs> John will love this. And it was, it w you know, it was perfect. So much ex just amazing framing in the film, the hotel scene, and then, of course, when she's sitting in front of that Texaco portrait. Yes. yes. You also use a lot of mirrors. How were you thinking yes. about production design and framing in as a way into this character? So that you never lost her. And when the script was originally written, there, it, there was a young child. Every time she looked in the mirror, she would see herself as a child. And we shot all of that. And then as we got into it, it was, it was, it was dumb. It was not necessary. It was overkill. And, but the, but what became a, a sort of running theme was this thing of imaging through, so that you, uh, you always saw her, another, you never left her mm -hmm. in a way. And uh, it was just another way to put two people in the frame too. <laughs> you know, it's cheating, it's okay. There's <laughs> that one scene after uh, she's, uh, uh, she and, uh, Richard Jordan spend the night together and she drinks the, she puts the <laughs> liquor in the, on her hands. That's totally Talia. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I just went, okay. It's Here so yeah. precious. It's yeah. so bizarre, but seems perfect. Yeah. How did you come to cast Talia Shire? Um, Paul had thought about her and I thought it was great because she'd just been, you know, Rocky's girlfriend. It was, you know. She's such a leading lady. And she is, she is really lovely and mysterious, you know. So that was it. His his choice. He knew John Belushi. He knew Richard, um, and w we both agreed about Tally. And and then <laughs> Buck Henry was a friend, and <laughs> um, Keith, of course, you know. So I brought a few things, and I love Bethel Leslie. I had always loved her. So it was, it was nice. It was a gorgeous cast. to ask, you mentioned the John Belushi fans being disappointed when it came out. What were some other reactions when the film first came out? Uh, a lot of people hated it. <laughs> and um, 
it, they, they either really loved it, they thought it was just swell. Uh, it didn't, it did not make a bazillion dollars on its first weekend. So um, as usual, if uh, money's always an issue in these things. But it really was split. And, um, but we did get to go to, I got to go to Director's Fortnight um, at the Cannes Film Festival. And it had its, it, it had, I felt solid about it and about the, you know, what had happened with the actors and all of that. But it, it was a mixed, mi very mixed review on it. Like, you know, some people liked it. I talked to um, a friend, Buck is, um, has had some health difficulty, and, but I did write him a note and tell him that since Vincent Camby had thought he was the only good thing in the movie, that would he like to come this <laughs> evening <laughs> and see himself. Hi. <laughs> um, could you talk a little bit about your work with Keith Carradine, and uh, especially in this movie, his, his physicality and his kind of uh, quirkiness was so wonderful? Keith, um, I'd known him obviously f through the f McCabe and Mrs. Miller and, and Nashville. And, um, and Thieves Like Us. And right Thieves Like Us that, that you'll see. Um, and you'll see, when you see him in that movie, he's he and Shelley were just gorgeous, you know. Um, he had a very a calm quality about him. He listened well to everything. He was curious, and you could slip a suggestion, and he would bring you three more things. So usually, my way of working with actors is to watch and to listen. And you know maybe miss, uh, whisper two things in their ear just to take a shift, and then they'll you know he's smart. He's a very smart actor, and so it was an easy process in that way. Um, I would say that uh, Belushi was also um, <laughs> uh, Belushi had his own quirks. And um, the night that we did the love scene, on <laughs> the night that we did the love scene on the hill uh, with Belushi, he um, wasn't quite sure that he would get through that <laughs> or not. He managed to do just fine. But Keith is, it was a in, is a quiet actor, and you don't have to do a lot of prodding. You just sort of send it in a direction, and and. The character is written in the script is the character that he fulfilled, certainly, you know, in a very gentle way. And Bethel helped as well. I mean, her, the strength of that actress is, is quite extraordinary, so. How did you, um, how did you work the voiceover with um, Talia Shire's on screen? We did, th we did three different ages. Mm -hmm. uh, my daughter is one of them. <laughs> um, and there was a lot more to it. And once again, like the image in the mirror, you didn't need a lot. Mm -hmm. you, just needed a, you just needed to thread enough in so you had cause. And you could see why she was pissed off about Belushi, you know. And so it was, but again, it, we overshot, overdid, had too much. It's like cooking, you know. You just keep pulling it down, pulling it down, pulling it down. But there were three, absolutely three different ages. Was the voiceover in the original version when it was Old Girlfriends? I don't know. I really, I don't know, because I just, I saw this version of their, of their material. the 
idea for the script and or would you ever recommend doing such a thing? <laughs> Pardon me, doing what? Oh, tracking down old boyfriends. <laughs> uh, no, I don't think so. I mean, <coughs> well, sometimes, well, I mean, we won't go into that. Well, it's sort of a happy uh, ending, though. It has a nice ending, yes. Um, the idea came, it was, def it was a, sh a script for, from Paul and Leonard, and it was their tracking down old girlfriends, you know, which, um, that was their idea. So, yes. Joan. Hi. Chris McIntyre <laughs> from the Acorn People. Yes. <laughs> oh my gosh. So we worked together three years after this. Yes. And my question for you was, how difficult did you find it to transition from theatrical films into television, which, you know, where most of your career laid after this? Right. I didn't because I treated every television Just film like a feature um, and figuring that um, it was my way to make a feature film. And at that particular time, films for, for television were solid. I mean, there were, they were a solid story. And so um, I treated it no differently at all. Just, you know, less days. So, no, there's, to me, there's no difference. A movie is a movie is a movie, you know, so. Yes, there's. Hi, Joan. Hi. Um, I, I have to ask, what is the the history of this film's availability after its initial theatrical release? You know, I was shocked to have, before this wonderful series was programmed and, and advertised, uh, ha to have not heard of this film, even though I'm you know a big fan of your work. Um, and and so I, I'm just wondering, what you know, why do you think this film perhaps fell out of the public consciousness in a way that? other films, even films that were not successful theatrically at the time, didn't. Um, and then secondly, what influence among the people who have seen it have you heard about or, 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 or felt in feedback over the years? I, I couldn't help but think of the, uh, the wonderful film Broken Flowers by uh, Jim Jarmusch, which is, mm -hmm. is sort of like yeah. old girlfriends in a way, you know. Right. Um, but um, I don't know. It, um, in terms of happened to it, I think, again, people were confused by Belushi in a way. They expected it to be a different kind of movie. Um, it did, you know, it did well enough, I think. But at the time, um, it, I, I, I really am not sure. Um, and what's happening to the film now is that it's being addressed in a lot of these films. Uh, it's being addressed to be able to show them, you know, in in, a s in special venues, and um, with the great help of uh, someone who's very interested in promoting this kind of thing, Rialto Films, and but also just to try to get a, a reprint of this so that you can actually see what it looked like. Um, but it's hard to say. It really is hard to say because you're not, I, the d I am not responsible for the distribution or what happens to it afterwards. And it really has to do with the kind of popularity, who, who want, what movie star, you know, do people want to see? So I'm sorry not to be able to answer you more clearly. I wonder if Ed Pressman, do you, are you here? Is he here? Yeah. Do you? Would you like to comment on that question about um, the distribution of the film or how you um, marketed it or sort of what your experience was with the, its release? Well, as from Joan's point of view, it was an ordeal getting the film made. From my point of view, it was part of the getting the film made and distributed.
made even with blue cheese. No. Right, I'm seeing it, seeing it tonight. I gotta say, uh, I, I saw it for the first time at uh, Hard Rock. So well, it is. It's not new. It's no more busted mostly. Yes, but we all were. Really <laughs> 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 but I, I really, really enjoyed it. I really liked it. Yeah, me too. You know, <laughs> good. <laughs> Chris and the. What I find the most amazing aspect of this film is the way you, with reckless abandon, switch genres from one boyfriend to the next, mm -hmm. <laughs> and thereby probably confounded far too many expectations uh -huh. for the film to be successful in its time. But now, when you know, looking at it from more of a postmodern Viewpoint. I think it's just, it's really amazing. Thank you. Were, were you <laughs> conscious of that when you were constructing the film? Yeah, we were conscious sure. of it. Yeah, and this is this is why I point out uh, Peter Jameson's work, mm -hmm. because it was a um, I, at the at that time I worked from still photographs a lot, and I would bring in books, and so Peter and I went through all the looks for each of these things, and he sprung the, the Great Red Hotel. Um, and then Fraker, we would go through the um, color and, you know, what, what emphasis to place with each, each of these men. Um, and it, it, yes, it was, it was a very careful study, and it's almost like different sets of paintings for each of, of, you know, these boys. And the, the scenes in the, in the Keith Carradine section, um, uh, some of it was shot in Seattle, some of it was shot in South Pasadena. Um, uh, John Hausman's office was at Immaculate Heart College, which is now AFI. Um, so, we had the opportunity to to have that one location trip to get exteriors. And then Talia at the time was married to David Shire, who wrote the um, score. Some of it is a, a tad over the top. <coughs> and you're sort of going, oh my God. <laughs> but for the most part, the, the gentle theme is, is, is really lovely, so. We have to go to our next film. Do you want to say anything briefly, set us yes. up for Thieves Like Us? Cause I, I will. Uh, it's, it was a film, again, that was made with $20 bills, practically. Um, the Bob uh, Altman and Jerry Bick a and uh, George Leto at the time was uh, Altman's agent. Um, Bick had the rights to the, to the book. Um, it was a straight, I really, it was a straight adaptation from uh, th Thieves Like Us. And we were to shoot the film in Mississippi and two times we went down to start pre-production and two times we had lost the money for the film from Los Angeles <laughs> to Mississippi on the airplane ride. Finally, those three um, stood in near the Xerox machine in the production office, and they all said, okay, I'll mortgage this much of my house. I mean, that's how the film got made. Um, it, is a, it is a really, it's beautiful, and finally you'll get to see nice color next. Um, it was shot in the spring in Mississippi. Bob hired uh, Jean-Baptiste, um, a French cinematographer who would not be prejudiced or know anything about what was going on in the South at that time. Um, at that time, it was it was pretty intense, um, and I was <coughs> often in charge of going out and finding locations. I had very long hair, 
and I was told as I was, <laughs> I went up one, walked up one side of the street, across the street, came back, and I finally found the beauty shop and that we were looking for. And the woman inside the beauty shop said, girl, if you don't tie up your hair, somebody's gonna come and cut it off. That was the climate that we were shooting in. It was a six week schedule. Um, it was classic in one sense that Bob pulled all of those actors out of McCabe and Mrs. Miller. So we all had known each other for a very long time. And it's a sweet film, and it's heartbreaking in a lot of ways. And um, it's when you see Shelley and Keith, they're just, they're absolutely beautiful. And it was released the same weekend as The Great Gatsby with Robert Redford. And so you can see where Thieves Like Us fell in the mix. Um, Pauline Kael liked it, though. <laughs> so. Thank you, Joan Tewksbury.